Uh, Bothell City Council is back from executive session. Uh, next on our agenda is the review, the projected agenda. Is there any changes to the projected agenda? Councilmember Spivey? Just a heads up, Mayor, that I am scheduled to work on um, the 5th and the 10th. I mean, I'm sorry, the 3rd and the 10th. So I will not be able to attend those meetings. Okay, anything else for the projected agenda? Councilmember Sandberg. <laughs> So when um, we last talked about the projected agenda in July, um, I thought we had received agreement from the council to invite the director of, um, for lack of a better term, the methadone clinic up in Bothell um, to describe what their, um, you know, what services they offer. Um, there had been an email requesting about, you know, p police activity, just understanding a little bit more on how their treatment services work um, in the context of uh, working on our one of our council goals um, regarding opioid addiction. And um, so I would hope that we could invite that director here um, at their convenience, because I think getting that perspective would inform us some more about our discussion on safe injection sites. I think there's a there's a lot of uh, passion around that right now, but it does help to have um, experienced knowledge in that field come and speak to us. So um, I would ask again, and I thought we had talked about this in July, that we invite the director, um, if possible, to come talk to us. And you know, I'm. We don't. We have a. We have a light meeting on October 10th. It's a study session. Maybe. If they're not available for, you know, that quick in the agenda, you know, think about something in November as a study session item or as a special presentation. City Manager, go ahead. Again, um, working very hard to manage the staff's workload, and so I didn't perceive this um, direction from council to be a priority, and to put these kinds of items on the agenda. Staff is expected when the council asks us to, to discuss it or is, is asking to discuss the topic, it is my expectation that staff becomes informed on that topic so it can respond to questions from the council. And so just putting an item on the agenda isn't as simple as, as one might perceive it to be. There needs to be work by the staff to be prepared to be able to have that discussion. So a study session with a director of a clinic here would still require staff time to be prepared for that discussion. So I haven't made that assignment. And again, I didn't perceive it to be a, a top priority for the council. So it, I would look for direction if that's something that you want to happen on a date certain. Um, I could try to, I, I, would, I would then reorganize the staff's priorities. And I understand, I don't want to, I know that staff has already got a full plate and I don't like to add to a full plate. Um, and I would offer my services based on my professional experience in talking with the director in advance and you know, giving them an idea of you know, what sort of things we would be interested for a policy make, interesting for a policy maker and also hearing from them what kind of information they think would be useful for us to hear as a policy maker. So I'm willing to to make that effort, I'm willing to invite um, any other council members that don't violate an OPMA um, rule to engage in that conversation so that we limit the amount of staff time on this. And I appreciate that, um, and there's certainly a policy role there, but if I'm gonna put an item on the agenda, um, you've asked me to, to be prepared for council meetings. That, that I wouldn't be comfortable um, until the staff has evaluated that topic and be able to speak to and respond to council questions. So you're always welcome to meet with members of the community. Those are, those are important policy discussions to have, um, but it doesn't alleviate the staff work that happens on the back end to prepare for that item, in, in my opinion, unless council directs otherwise. Okay, uh, anything else for the projected agenda? Council Member Freed? Yeah, I just want to piggyback on that. Um, I don't, they often, they do have methadone at that clinic, but I know they have so much more subloxone and other very helpful medications. I think having a treatment center within Bothell is a positive thing. Uh, that's what we as society, as I understand, are dedicated to making sure that we're getting people back to health. When that methadone clinic came, I remember it was several years ago, and the director came here and spoke to council, and 
there was, he said there's a lot of stigma that surrounds these things, yet Bapa at the time opened them with open arms because it was a center that was dedicated to get people back to health. So I, I would love to have three of us potentially go on a tour there and others can <laughs> arrange their time as long as we're not cross-talking with each other if we can't get it on the schedule. Um, I do look at October 10th, which is completely empty at this time if there's an opportunity. And then November 7th, that got canceled due to the election. I don't re recall canceling meetings before due to the election. So maybe we could reinstate that night. And then I don't know why September 12th got canceled either. Maybe I blanked out on that and there was some meeting that that happened and, and I missed, I'm not quite sure. Do we, do we have the opportunity? Yes, city manager. Opportunity to? To add something maybe on November 7th or October 10th if they're currently empty. So, so the council protocol manual states that the, that the city manager and the mayor determine the agenda mm -hmm. and the study session. So we have regular business on the first meeting and the third meeting of every month. And the second meeting is set aside for study sessions. And currently staff is working on some very major initiatives, including the purchase of the Wayne Golf Course and the UW Bothell uh, Master Plan, just to name a couple. Those are cross-departmental, massive responsibilities that fall above and beyond our normal course of work. And so I haven't initiated any new projects because we need to finish some very significant initiatives at the end, towards the end of this year. And so I haven't initiated any new work on any new projects that would require a study session. And therefore, I made the recommendation to the mayor. Um, I have nothing for a study session for September 12th. Okay. And we're, that's in the protocol manual. So we're trying to stay true now to the first and third meetings being regular business and the second being study sessions. Okay. And that's why that's been canceled. I inquired about the election um, with four seats up. Um, it is often, I haven't been, to, in, been in Bothell before an election. And so I inquired whether um, it would be appropriate to switch from the 7th to the 14th. Mm -hmm. um, again, I don't perceive for the 14th of November the need for a study session because I, I'm just, we don't have the staff capacity to take on new projects and I don't see a need for a study session in November. And so um, that was the decision that was made as we're managing the agenda. Sure, I, I can appreciate that. Great, thank you. So um, for me, I would like to see us as a council have a discussion before the end of October on heroin injection sites. Is there any support to have that conversation? So because this has been an issue for the second time this meeting, let's go ahead and, and do a formal motion and a second, if there is one. There is a motion, is there a second? I move that we have a discussion of heroin injection sites prior to the end of October. Second. It's been moved and seconded to have a heroin injection site discussion by the end of October. Is there any discussion on the motion? Deputy Mayor. I don't see the point in taking a vote when something's already not allowed in the city. I, I resent council being used as a political um, body for someone, someone's private PAC. Anybody else like to speak on the motion? Councilmember Sandberg. I, I voted before to talk about it tonight for 15 minutes, but it's becoming non-productive. Um, I imagine um, myself and other council members will go and talk to the, the director and maybe we can prepare our own white paper um, and and have that just for council consideration um, because I just think it's becoming non-productive now. Agreed, is there any other discussion on the motion? Yeah. Councilman Spivey? Yes, uh, I, I think it's prudent to have discussion. Uh, we, we don't know that the county may or may not change their ordinance. Uh, the county owns a building in the south end of the city that was a health care facility that they may in the future want to try and turn into a, a safe injection site. I, I think it's something to, that we need to talk about and I, I think it's better to take a stand one way or the other than just to be silent on it. So I think it's prudent to have a discussion about it and take a stand on it. And, and so the public knows firmly where we, where we are with it. Great. Anybody else? You already had a chance to I speak didn't to your speak motion. I didn't speak to my motion. Oh, okay, go ahead. No, good. Well, I'm certainly in support of having our community take a uh, conversation about it. I think the community would like to be invited to have the conversation. If you looked at the statistics that I know and have become very familiar with when heroin injection sites open in Canada, the death from illicit drugs that come from that opening because it's the legalization of heroin, I don't think we as a community would want that within our community. And no, when uh, statements made that this is just a personal thing for a pack that I run, 
yeah, I do run a pack that is dedicated to make sure that we don't have heroin injection sites and legalize heroin within King County. It's a very passionate issue of mine. I've sat with people and users on the sidewalk. I've met with people who have recovered from it. This absolutely is important to me because I care for people who want to see them get back to health. So we as a city, have uh, an opportunity to speak about this. Other cities have spoken about it and ban heroin injection sites because they want to make their intentions very clear to King County. So I would hope that the majority of council would know this is not some personal vendetta in the sense that I'm trying to get somebody back and get personal attention. There's plenty of other cities that are discussing this and banning it. There's a lot of uh, radio and TV that have been discussing it. This is a huge issue that people in current elections are talking about and I'm sure as time goes by, we'll continue to talk about. There's overwhelming support throughout the county. Uh, when we've done polling, we found that we're at least 65 and sometimes up to 80% support against heroin injection sites within King County. So I am not alone. I got 70,000 signatures saying we don't want these here. So I would love for the council to talk about it. Any further discussion, Councilor Agnew? I think we're uh, walking on a slippery slope here. I think we're, we're looking at it as a disease that is epidemic. I, I don't think politicians should make public health decisions. I think we have wonderful people in the public health system that seem to know what they're doing. I know Council Member Freed has said that uh, he's been up to Canada. They put in the injection sites in 2003 and they had overdoses of heroin decreased by 30% over the next two years in that area. But they've also increased the amount of overdoses exponentially because it is an epidemic. I think if we're gonna talk about this, we need to talk about this, but I think we need a lot more information than we're getting and I don't think politicians should make public health decisions. So I just have a couple of things to add. Uh, Initiative 27 did collect some $70,000, or $70,000, uh, 70,000 votes, and they will be going to the public to vote on uh, whether they want to ban injection sites in, in the entirety of King County. So I personally have no interest in trying to circumvent that and banning it or making the decision for the general public. Um, people were invited to contact me directly about safe injection sites, especially when they were told that I wanted one in the city of Bothell, which I do not. Um, but I have received not one message, email, phone call to date from any uh, community member in our city that would like to talk to me about this. So I don't see any need after what the city attorney read from the King County Code, injection sites are banned in the city. So. I believe everybody's had a chance to talk. Go ahead and place your vote. The vote would be, affirmative vote would be to place it on the, uh, in safe injection sites on the agenda in October, by October. <laughs> it is the first day back. Do, okay. Go ahead and vote again. Uh, fails, or sorry, yeah, fails uh, with Council Member Spivey and Freed in the affirmative and everybody else in the negative. Next on the agenda, is there any other, sorry, is there any other projected agenda changes? Seeing none, uh, visitor comment period. So, uh, one second. Each person addressing the council will give his or her name in an audible tone of voice for the record and unless the council grants further time shall limit the address to three minutes, no person other than the council and the person having the floor will be permitted to enter into any discussion, either directly or through a member of council without the permission of the mayor. And if you're here for the public hearing, this isn't, this isn't the time. You guys will have an opportunity later in the agenda. Unless you want to speak now, you're welcome to. Uh, the first sign up is and 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 Viria. Oh, go ahead, go to the podium there. I uh, thank you every, everyone for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Anand Viria. Uh, before I start, you know, I just wanted to find out whether my house falls under the uh, city of Bothell's management area. It's uh, thirty-seven twenty-eight on the 39th, you know, 224th Street. So, 
it's uh, 98021, that's the zip code. There was a proposal to integrate that part of the city into, into the city of Basel, but I frankly don't know at this time whether it falls under the Basel city administration or at the you know the Snohomish County Sheriff's Office area. Like, But uh, there are two things I, I would like to address. Um, this is, uh, you know, on the 39th Avenue, I bought this. I've been living in Bothell since uh, 2009, and uh, there has been a lot of uh, developments have been approved on the 39th corridor. And the traffic impact, I, I believe the city has studied or the town has, or the county has studied the traffic impact on these roads. It's, it's becoming a nightmare. Uh, even to take a right turn into 228th, we have to wait for 10 minutes. And still, there are a lot of developments have been approved. And especially like a couple of days back, I was just seeing that on the 35th Avenue from 228th to the 240th, you know, there was complete traffic back. You know, the, the traffic was full all through that, that section of the 35th Avenue, which is almost a mile. And at the intersection of 248th and 35th, it's only a four-way stop sign. So, um, you know, a lot of people uses that road because of the congestion of 405, you know, a lot of, and a lot of offices are there in that area. So it, it's, uh, it's a nightmare to use those road uh, during the morning peak hours and as well as in the evening peak hour time. I would like to know what, what the city is planning to do. Are they going to put a traffic light and the intersection um, of 248th uh, and the 35th Avenue uh, are going to put a roundabout. That is one question. And the second related question is on the 35th Avenue, uh, some section, a part of, I think maybe a one fourth of the section of the road has no sidewalks. It's pretty dangerous to walk on that street with so much of traffic on that street. And a lot of people may, may use, you know, like opt to walk to their work, but because of that si missing sidewalk in that area, um, you know, it is, a, it is a public hazard, I believe, not to have a sidewalk in that section of this uh, road, okay? So I would like to know what the city is planning to do about it. And the third part is, you know, I don't know whether this is an appropriate forum, but, you know, this is about the RTA tax, which all of us, all of us got a sticker shock. So am I allowed to continue? That's the, your, the, your three minutes, but okay. I'll have you connect with the uh, city manager. She's right here on the end. She can, she can get you her business card. I have your phone number. Okay. Um, you do not live in the city limits, but that doesn't, there, we do have problems up there and we'd like to hear your experience. Okay. Then. All right, thank, thank you. you. Next is Juliet Johansson. never done this before uh, but I came to speak about safe injection sites uh, can I do that okay um, I have been a Bothell resident for over 17 years I own a business in the city of Bothell and have owned it for about 11 years now I have two children that attend school in North Shore School District and I'm a single mother because I've lost a husband to addiction. He used the methadone clinic you were talking about. He was an alcoholic. It took me years to get him out of the house. Um, he left about six years ago. I received no resources. I support two children. Um, and he re receives plenty of resources. Um, so after several years of battling to get him out of the house, uh, for alcohol and possibly drug abuse. I've recently discovered he has been in and out of jail for theft and various other drug-related charges. The emotional toll it has taken on my daughters has changed the course of their lives forever. While I think the idea of a safe injection site would be a great idea if we lived in a perfect utopian world, the reality is that an injection site will only encourage and enable anyone that has the propensity to use and wants to use, they will go to that site. A person that wants to get clean will only do so if they want to, no matter what support is offered to them. An injection site will only enable and bring people to our city 
to take advantage of this service and I'm certain that statistically the number is very small for people getting clean because of a site. As a parent, business owner, and tax-paying citizen, I strongly feel that a safe injection site will not only become a problem, but a great excuse for an addict to use. I think it's important to note that a lot of cities that were on the task force have said no to allowing an injection site in their cities. So I'm confused as to why Bothell would actually allow for a safe injection site to be located here. I'm the face of a person that has suffered at the hands of addiction. So um, that's all I kind of have to say. I hope that um, you do have another meeting about this and I'll be happy to attend and support against this in any way possible to keep families safe. Thank you. Thank you. That's the end of our sign-up sheet. Is there anybody else that would like to give public comment? Seeing none, we'll move into the consent agenda. There's been no items pulled. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. moved by Councilmember Agnew, seconded by, was that you, Councilmember Sandberg? I'll second it. <laughs> Any discussion on the motion? Please place your vote. Passes unanimously. We're into the boards and commissions. AB 17-134, Arts and Festivals Committee Work Plan. And you guys get to go sit right down here about, so we can look down at you. For, sorry about that, but please, you have name tags too. Uh, it's a sign seating. Or you can move them around. Um, and we have Director Keats. I believe you have some a staff presentation to begin with. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yes, I have a brief presentation uh, for you tonight. No PowerPoint, though. And. Uh, um, would like to uh, welcome all the Arts and Festivals Commission members to the meeting and also sitting here is uh, Danae McGee who's our Tourism and Events Coordinator who's been spending a little bit of time with the Arts and Festivals Commission. So um, the uh, Arts Commission or Arts and Festivals Commission was uh, um, fully, uh, the, the decision to go with the commission was made earlier this year and in March uh, the council went through a uh, uh, recruitment process and interviewed um, a number of candidates and uh, ended up uh, appointing seven members to the first Arts and Festivals Commission. Um, we held our first meeting in April of this year and have been meeting uh, monthly subsequently since then. Uh, Jennifer Keen is, has been chosen as the chairperson. Uh, Mike Doan is the vice chair. Mike couldn't be here tonight, but uh, um, Jennifer's done a great job running the meetings, and in the time that uh, we've uh, been meeting, the couple of the programs they have uh, already come up with was uh, uh, implementing displays of artwork at our Music in the Park series, and uh, have been looking at some of the artwork uh, that was formerly recommended by the uh, Art Committee uh, for City Hall here. So uh, we do meet the fourth Thursday of the month at 7 o'clock, and... Um, the commission members are, of course, Mike Doan, Pat Pierce, Jennifer Keene, Kelly Atkinson, Katrina Sather, Kelly Moeller, and Lynn Asman. And uh, over the first couple months when we uh, got together, we uh, started uh, putting together a um, work plan for the, uh, for the commission. And some of the things that some have already been accomplished and some are still a work in progress. But uh, one of the first things the commission did was adopted uh, bylaws for the uh, commission, which they've done. Um, the group has also been done doing some uh, preliminary work in looking at a possible uh, Bothell uh, Film Festival. Uh, they've uh, been looking at a, uh, and uh, last, last month uh, started going through a public art policy for Bothell. Um, they've made recommendations for the um, Bothell, uh, former Bothell Arts Committee initiatives. Again, I mentioned the Art in the Park uh, commenced this year. Uh, 
uh, there was some other uh, slides added for the uh, PowerPoint uh, uh, display out in the, in the foyer, and those will have been passed on to the um, information technology folks, and that those should be up uh, shortly. Uh, we've wanted to schedule a joint meeting with council, so here we're here tonight doing that. Again, selection of a chair and a vice chair, which has been done. Another effort was to research community events to ascertain uh, what's being offered and when, and uh, that's somewhat of a work in progress. I also looked at a, a City Hall art gallery um, update, and um, another uh, a point of emphasis in the coming months will be considering uh, public art uh, projects and locations throughout the community. So these are just the items that uh, that the commission has uh, worked on so far, and I think we're here tonight to just have some dialogue with council and uh, hopefully get some direction and make sure that we're moving down uh, the right path for uh, success. And I'll conclude with that and let uh, you take over, Mr. Mayor. We'll have at it. Um, so, so I had a couple of things. I think your work plan looks pretty good, um, pretty ambitious. Um, one of the things that came up, and, and Lynn Asman, uh, full disclosure, I knew her since I was in fourth grade or something like that, but she um, she has some concerns. So she wasn't able to make it tonight, but she um, was a member of the former Bothell Arts Committee. And the former Bothell Arts Committee worked for years, it looks like, to try to um, figure out artwork for City Hall, because it's 1% one per, one for the arts is something that we pay on top of the construction costs um, for buildings and that type of thing. Roads, I think, are excluded. But um, this building specifically was expensive, and so there was a, a large amount of art that needed to be uh, acquired. And they worked on it for some time, and then it looks like um, things kind of fell apart and it, and it stalled. And then the council, we created the Arts and Festivals Committee. And I, I just kind of wanted to know from the rest of council too and from you guys, but I, I didn't intend for the work of that committee to be, um, I guess, not brought forward to the council by starting an Arts and Festivals Committee. I thought it was um, a new committee and that was a prior committee totally separate from, yes, it's arts is in both uh, committees, but um, I, I would like to see what they produced and what their ideas were, and we have yet as a council to see them. So um, I'd like that to come forward. I don't know if you guys have had discussions about that or not, but I thought we'd maybe start there. Director Keats, you wanted to? Yeah, I can start, uh, okay. and the mem other members can chime in as, as well. Uh, we have looked at some, um, and what meeting, uh, upcoming meeting, we'll be bringing uh, uh, recommendations, I think, for four of them. Uh, there was another one that the commission looked at, and uh, actually, there was actually no vote. And then uh, there's a few others that we uh, just learned about that uh, uh, Pat Pierce let us know about that we'll be looking at in a future meeting as well. But uh, the uh, I think there's at least four uh, by Georgia Gerber, the artist that will be coming forth, uh, in, I think, in October. Okay. Or Council too, you can chime in if you have any recollection of how that all played out with the Bothell Arts Committee. Did you want to say something? Jennifer? <laughs> you can't ask, sorry. <laughs> We're going to give you a call later. <laughs> um, Jennifer, or Ms. Mrs. Ms. King? Yes. Is that okay? Thank okay. you. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you for meeting with us. We did get off to a little bit of a confused start because we weren't sure if we were continuing the work of the old committee or, or expected to do something completely different. So we we really want your feedback on what you actually want us to do. We kind of just, st each of us came in with some ideas of things that we would like to see. And so we kind of just each went on our own path and then came back together and discussed how things might work. But we really want to know what you guys want us to do. Deputy Mayor. Um, I agree with the mayor in terms of, I, I think, my thought, at least, process was that it, you would complete what had been started. Um, I, I like the work plan. I think it's really ambitious. I'm excited about a film festival. Um, I'd like, I'd, I don't see it on here, but, um, boy, I would like to give Winville a run for their money because they got it going on. And so I would love to see um, art. Featured more, you know, public art, 
featured throughout Bothell, not just the city hall. Um, and then the other the other thing I want to do it was just to ask Ms. Pierce um, about what's left from the old Arts Commission and what will be brought forward and how that's going or if, if things are proceeding as they should be. Well, the old Arts Commission recommended um, an otter, two beavers, and a cat, and those have already gone through the process of bids and siting and so forth. And at the time that we kind we stopped meeting as an art committee because of staffing issues and change in you know city manager and so forth. We didn't really want to bother council, so we let it go, thinking it would be picked up when things calmed down. So that left four things. Uh, three of them don't have a bid. We kind of stopped bothering because we didn't want to get artists all upset by calling them and getting bids and then having to come back two years later and so forth. So there's the uh, three pioneers, two herons, and a, a, a gaggle, a murder of crows, a mini murder of crows, <laughs> some crows that are left to, to look at. So four things left to look at. Ask a clarifying question. So the, um, those are on the agenda. They're just they're scheduled for later. Well, they're kind of or kind of not, depending on how you look at it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we could put them on the agenda. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, the murder of crows sounds great because if there's anything that's bothal, it's crows. crows. So, yeah, you know, I count all the crows as one kind of thing. They wouldn't all be together. But so, Director Keats, do you guys have documentation from the former arts? Is it commission or committee? I can't remember. It's a committee. 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 The former was the arts committee. So um, we now have everything. So the previous meeting, I think we had addressed uh, the four items that Pat mentioned and the three uh, um, the three men for, I, I don't know that we actually have a real term for it. And then we met uh, last week and, um, and got the, the last remaining ones. So yeah, we'll certainly get this on a future, uh, future agenda, so. I'd just like to see what, what the former committee created. Um, I've been holding the floor. Does anybody else want to talk? You guys are so quiet. Oh, there we go. Councilman Spivey. Great. Well, thank you all for stepping up and being part of this. I, I think it's an exciting time for to have this commission. Uh, I, I look forward to uh, the, the things that Pat brought up about the um, former committee had started and, and seeing that finished. <clears throat> um, and when you when you finish up with those projects, I, I say, you know, you guys own this. Take it in a great direction. Reach out to the public. I know the public wants Riverfest back, and there's other things. And so uh, there, there's festivals. And I, being on LTAC, I'm going to encourage multi-day festivals, um, something that helps uh, our uh, our hotels out there in, in the in the city. The, in, the, in the slower times of the year, and be aware that the LTAC does have um, grants available uh, to the city, to your commission, to anybody out there. <clears throat> so I would encourage you to apply for those grants. Um, I, and I have to agree that I, I think one thing that makes a, uh, a great community is having public art throughout the community, not just in parks or in city buildings. And uh, I, I look forward to uh, seeing some of that, uh, those ideas for different types of art in, uh, spread throughout the city and not, uh, not just in our um, downtown, but throughout into our neighborhood parks and into uh, maybe bits of public, you know, of, of city owned land or right of way or in, in all throughout the city. I, I think that's a, the treasure that comes from having a public arts commission that can put art in places where you don't expect it and it becomes kind of a neighborhood icon and, and all. So uh, I look forward to seeing uh, more on your work plan and uh, some great ideas from you and, uh, and all, and um, thank you for stepping up. Kids are quiet. Council Mayor McNeil. Thank you. I also want to thank you for, for stepping up, and I'm excited um, about the work plan. Um, I did have a question on the cultural events and what we're doing surrounding the multicultural events and trying to engage with the different 
cultural groups that were within our community and what we can do to engage with them and help them um, at some of these festivals and events and things like that to broaden our reach. Have you guys, is that part of the work plan in one of these areas or? Uh, no, it's not, but it certainly can be. I think um, focus has been on trying to finish the work of the previous committee and then sharing some other ideas, but it's great to get your input on that. I think that's something that we can definitely think about. Okay, yeah, so it seems like this is more arts driven um, and the word festival is just in there. So Correct. That is it gonna kind of blend into more festival? That's what we're hoping for. That's why um, John mentioned that we were kind of investigating what events and festivals are already happening. We didn't want to step on anybody's toes. So we were trying to educate ourselves on what's already being done and then kind of get our feet under us a little bit. And then once we just started to get, get ourselves organized, then we definitely want to look into doing more festivals and events. And for all those watching right now, how, if th those other groups, how would they get in touch with you? Well, they can call the, call my uh, direct number, 425-806-6751. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, if they, anybody wants to come to a commission, Arts and Festivals Commission meeting, we meet here on the fourth Thursday of the month at uh, seven o'clock, usually over in room 101 or 107, 108 and uh, welcome any, anybody who wants to come in. Fabulous, thank you again for all your hard work. Yes, you had something, Kelly? Yeah, I'd like to uh, just follow up on your suggestion, and it would be great if the Arts Commission could get some type of presence on the, the city website for, for that purpose, so oh. we could get some public feedback. Okay, fabulous, thank you. Please. Um, I don't want to ha have us sound like we were not really accomplishing anything, and especially with the festivals. I think that we've discussed having festivals um, in 2018. I think we needed to get our feet on the ground and get some of the, the hard um, baseline work done. But we did initially in 2017 start with the summer concerts, at least flew into those with abandon, and um, hopefully we'll be able to continue to do that. But the, the festivals is not just a word that we have talked about it and it has been on our agendas. And so, and it is in the plan. Um, I just don't think that it's solidified yet with specifics, just so you know. Well, I'll jump in there. The, the member, one of the members that's missing has done a lot of work looking at, at uh, movie festivals. And so there's been a lot of work done on that. He's quite good at finding things out. <laughs> Councilor Sayward. Yes, thank you for volunteering to serve your com community in this way. It's it's really important and it's a lot of hard work. Um, I noticed that on the city's website they have a, uh, a news article about $50,000 in tourism grants available from the city of Bothell and then the LTAC, which is the Lodging Tax and Advisory Committee. Um, and um, residents or board members can apply if they have um, projects and events or activities that would attract visitors. So um, what do you see is the, the um, intersection point between the work that you're doing and the work that the LTAC is doing? Because it seems like they could be a source of money and you with community involvement can be the source of ideas and, and additional energy. You know, this has happened before in the city through the LTAC funds that on occasion the city and LTAC have worked together to fund either through the grant process or directly things like River Fest and the 4th of July parade uh, going back to the very beginning when, when it started out, the hotel motel tax uh, program started out. So there sometimes it's just kind of funneled through the city for things like the 4th of July and at other times a group will be involved with the city and will write a grant uh, for that. Those grants used to also go for arts projects like murals and, and, and other things so that you had like the Summit Sabothel bike ride was linked together with an art project for <coughs> sculptural bike racks. I don't know exactly how the current LTAC committee will go forward with some of this because every time it changes a bit when it comes back in. But it is a great possibility for putting together 
you know, things, festivals and other events for the whole community. Okay, thanks, and I and I also support um, your idea, Kelly, of getting some expanded presence on the website because um, LTAC's on there, and you guys should do the same thing. If I may uh, just follow up on that, that you know, we've only met a handful of times so far, and um, similar to what the city manager was saying earlier, is once you get your feet under yourself with um, getting approval for this information that we submitted to you for a plan. I, I think those kind of ideas, as Mr. Spivey was saying and Mr. McNeil was saying, we will start in sincerely talking about uh, down the line about um, festivals that celebrate our cultures, um, art in, in satellite areas of the, of the city. So I, I think it, most of our focus was, was simply on just getting getting some of this going, getting the foundation established. And I, I think we got a great group of people here with a bunch of good ideas. Who would like to go next? Uh, Deputy Mayor. I just wanted to encourage you not to take on everything, every idea that we have up here. <laughs> I was on the landmark board for a long time. It takes a long time to get stuff done. So be patient and pace yourself and maybe one festival at a time. We don't have to do everything next year. <laughs> um, with that, thank you. We're, we're really excited. It was, um, we had some great candidates, but you guys really rose to the top, and so we're super excited to have you aboard. Councilman Fried. Great, and I encourage you actually to dream big. Uh, you have a, a great opportunity as creative people sitting on a creative board to think about a lot of the visions that we could have, think about the impossible, things that uh, we could attain if we just put our mind to it. So Buffalo is all about community. We have a lot of history, a lot of people here, and we're like a fabric that's uh, woven together. And the more that we can bring people together, like community events of the 4th of July with 15,000 people here, that's why people love coming to Bothell. They love 4th of July. They love the feeling of community that we have. So the more opportunities that you offer like that, I think the greater that we become as a community. So do think big, dream big. One thing I'd like to put before you is potentially having like a pioneer day up at Centennial Park. We have a wonderful park in Snohomish County. A lot of our events do take place in King County. Um, I want to make sure that we have our eyes on a wonderful park up there. We acquired that many years ago, put a, the old schoolhouse up there. And so I think there's a lot of opportunities. I know parking can sometimes be a consideration there, but maybe that could be figured out. So thank you so much for bringing in all your thoughts and creativity to this board. And I think that uh, we're going to have some neat opportunities that come forward. Thanks. So I have a, I have a couple other items. Uh, so the possibility of a Bothell film, fest film Festival, I think that's great. Um, if you guys are ready to have some ideas about that, I think we could work with the school district for you guys to potentially get it, at least at one of the high school fields, if not the Popkini field, which I think would be really good. I mean, who knows if they'll let us, but just an idea. And there's parking available there too. Um, the City Hall PowerPoint slideshow, please, please, please take our gigantic pictures off that slideshow. It's the most embarrassing thing to walk in and see a four foot wide <laughs> version of your face. Um, and so if you have, please take those down. Um, the other thing too is that um, Deputy Mayor kind of brought this up, but I've been giving Public Works a hard time about how ugly those concrete medians are that we're, we've been building in the last few projects, especially in the Snohomish County portion of the city. Um, and you can actually put really neat artwork on those. Um, there's one that went in in Woodenville, it's this wind chime, and I don't know if you've seen it when the wind's blowing, but that thing, you can always get in a car accident. It's beautiful, it's really it's really a neat, uh, a neat thing. So uh, if you guys are interested in that, I would love to find out more about how we could try to beautify the beautiful concrete stamped medians that we've been building in the medians on uh, stay route 527 and five, uh, there's one on 522, but mostly on 527, the project in Stormish County. But thank you very much coming from all of us that volunteer a lot too. Uh, we can't do all this without volunteers, so uh, appreciate all your time and effort and uh, good luck to you all. Do you guys have anything to add? You got enough stuff to do now. <laughs> okay. Thanks for coming in. Mayor? Yep. Um, I, I apologize. We're, we kind of 
things got fired up at the beginning of the meeting, and I was wondering if I could have just a brief moment of personal privilege to recognize somebody. Sure. Um, it's uh, just recently a um, longtime community leader and former council member, Ray Schaff, passed away. And Ray was a business owner, he was a coach, and again, he was a council member, and he, he coached um, youth football up until his 70s. And, and Ray was somebody that was very well known in the community and all. And I just wanted to recognize um, uh, the loss of somebody that was uh, pretty, um, pretty vibrant in our community for such a long time uh, and that also served up here uh, as a council member. So I, just, I thank you for that moment. And uh, I just, again, wanted to recognize that we lost, uh, we lost a very good man in Ray Schaff. Thank you for letting us know. Okay, so we are on to the fun part of the agenda. AB 17-135, it's a continued public hearing. Uh, it's an ordinance establishing a downtown utility fringe improvement reimbursement area. I don't believe I need to reopen the public hearing. No, I do not. Oh, Mayor, okay, I'm officially opening the public hearing. Uh, there's a brief staff presentation by Mr. Fien and Paul. Maybe, maybe Paul. And then we're gonna go in after that, there will be a uh, opportunity for public comment. I believe the council has agreed to five, minute, five minutes per person instead of three uh, for this specific public hearing. So take it from there, Mr. Fien. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council Members, Don Fien, Utility Services Manager, and this is the continued public hearing of the Downtown Utility and Frontage Improvements Reimbursement Area. Uh, brief recap. Um, the infrastructure improvements and that in the downtown area um, were detailed in our 2011 downtown revitalization utility phasing cost partitioning and financing study and the detailed cost splits uh, and rationale for the downtown infrastructure improvements were in there and it was presented to council in 2011 and this has been utilized for the city surplus property purchase and sales agreement since 2012. Um, necessary public system improvements in the downtown area have been constructed by developer projects and city capital projects. Developers of city surplus properties such as Six Oaks constructed infrastructure improvements for the downtown. The city's also re has been reimbursed for downtown capital projects through surplus property purchase and sales agreements. The remaining projects constructed by the city that benefit the downtown properties are covered by this proposed reimbursement ordinance. And this is the area we're talking about. You can see the uh, properties um, along 98th Avenue and Multiway Boulevard that are impacted by this ordinance. Here's also a picture of the improvements that are um, we're seeking reimbursement for on multi-way. No longer includes the access lane. We took that out after the second public uh, open house. And the one, the this, this is the improvements on 98th Avenue that are included, sidewalks and appurtenances. And a summary, the downtown utilities frontage improvement reimbursement area is a mechanism for developers to pay their share of improvements. Uh, Multi-way frontage improvements included two items, the access road and silver cells that were removed as atypical improvements for Bothell. All other improvements would be required of the developer for these sites consistent with our city policy. Staff held two open houses with owners and made some revisions to the previous recommendations. Um, one thing we researched and there was not enough evidence for was to support the, that, that, that private contract costs are significantly different than public prevailing wage costs. We had a study uh, performed by a consultant to, to examine that. Um, also, another uh, point to uh, bring out is the city's large project had economy of scale benefits. Um, since we had a larger project and the other, um, if the, the owners were to do it themselves, they would have to uh, build smaller projects. 
Um, also, the charges are construction costs in 2016 dollars, which are cheaper than the costs that would be incurred for development paid in future dollars at the time of development. <clears throat> and with that, um, regarding the public hearing, um, we held a public hearing on July 18th. Staff originally sent notice of the hearing to affected properties as required. After the notice was sent, staff learned that two uh, owners had changed. We had insufficient time to provide notice to the owners, and that's why we're continuing it to tonight to provide opportunity for the owners to, if they wish to speak. With that, it's a continued public hearing. Um, we could take on questions as well. Uh, staff recommendation is to adopt the ordinance establishing the downtown reimbursement area. Okay, thank you. Is the, the city attorney, did he have something to add or he's not in the room? Uh, city manager, did, did he have something he wanted to add before the public comment? I don't believe that he did, no. Okay. Moving on to public comment. The first is uh, Milt R Reimers. Reimers. Sorry if I'm getting that wrong. And City Clerk, you have the timer for five minutes instead of three. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you to the council. <clears throat> My name is Milt Reimers, and I'm an attorney at Schwabie Williamson and Wyatt Law Firm, and we represent uh, Neffner Limited Partnerships and 98th Avenue Investment Partners as well as Widener Homes, which is doing business um, through the entity um, Bothaway Apartments. And both Neffner 98th and Bothaway Apartments own property within the uh, downtown area uh, and within the proposed uh, assessment reimbursement area. Um, so I'm here to urge the council to reconsider the proposed assessment. Um, and our law firm has, has put forward uh, letters to the council outlining a number of our legal objections uh, but today, tonight, I just want to touch upon a couple of the, our objections with regard to the specific cost amount that's being proposed by the council. Um, the assessment being considered by the council is, is unreasonable um, because it is, it is too high and disproportionate to the affected owners. And, um, and this is a statutory requirement that proposed assessments be reasonable and proportionate, proportionate to owners. And uh, our clients have hired Don Bowser, uh, a longtime 30-year uh, real estate and construction consultant who put together a cost analysis memo. And that memo uh, outlined uh, Don's uh, analysis of the costs and the proposed assessment. And Don's um, analysis was based upon not only his experience, but two recent projects that he had participated in, one within the Coal Creek Parkway area of um, of Newcastle and the other within the Crossroads area of Bellevue. Both of those um, projects were um, uh, related to the, I'm sorry, the Crossroads neighborhood project related to frontage improvements and the Coal Creek project related to both frontage and uh, utility improvements. And the comps, those two comps were very similar to the work that was being done in downtown Bothell in that, uh, for example, the frontage improvements included um, street, sidewalk, curb, trees, and lighting. And uh, Don's analysis, Mr. Bowser's analysis, was done on a square footage basis and then converted into a linear foot basis so that it was comparable to the work and the costs associated with, um, with downtown Bothell. Um, ultimately, Mr. Bow Mr. Bowser concluded that the cost per linear foot for the frontage improvement should have been $305, and that's as compared to the $789 that's currently being considered by the city, um, and that the utility improvements should have been $126 as compared to the $167 per linear foot being considered by the city. Um, so as they stand now, the, the proposed reimbursement is, um, is unreasonable and disproportionate to the effect on the, on the owners. Um, I just want to touch upon the, the Gray and Osborne report that's been relied upon the city um, that analyzed the cost of, of making the improvements as public work project as compared to a private sector project. And Gray and Osborne's March 30th, uh, 2000, 2017 memo concluded with a recommendation to the council that, quote, no deduction be made 
on total project cost when determining costs to be included in the latecomers assessment. Uh, but the memo, which is only a page and a half, was very short on authority and evidence. And all that Gray and Osborne had done, as they acknowledged in their in their memo, was um, cite to some anecdotal communications that they had had with contractors about the construction market. So, um, you know, if anything, the Gray and Osborne memo memo um, actually supports the analysis by Mr. Bowser uh, in that in, in that memo in that same memo, Gray and Osborne acknowledged that, uh, quote, in their experience, public works projects using prevailing wage rates typically increase project costs from 10 to 20 percent of the total project cost when comparing equal projects. Uh, so they themselves acknowledge that there is a higher cost um, generally when doing these sorts of projects, and they don't provide any evidence for why, um, uh, why that isn't the case here. So it's our, opi our opinion that uh, Mr. Bowser's analysis is spot on and that he did a thorough investigation um, and analysis, and to the extent that the council um, does not uh, does not uh, rely upon Mr. Bowser's analysis, we would ask that uh, that they consider the fact that Gray and Osborne themselves acknowledged that 10 to 20 percent increase for for such public projects. Um, we ask the council to to reconsider the proposed assessment and uh, and only to impose an assessment that is reasonable and proportionate on on the affected owners. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Jim Bush. I have a question for the speaker. City Attorney, do we allow questions of the speakers during public hearings, comments? Uh, it's, I don't know if the protocol manual speaks to that. It's definitely up to council if they want to um, uh, ask questions of each speaker as they conclude or wait until um, everyone has had a chance to speak and then ask questions. Then I can ask the staff this question if you won't allow me to ask the, the presenter, but I will ask the question of staff later. So we have 10 people that are signed up to talk. I'm just trying to be efficient with their time. It is simple yes, no question. I will ask staff later. Jim Bush. Good evening, Council. My name is Jim Bush. I own parcel 31 which is on the corner of 186 and Bothell Way, right across the street from McMenamin's um, Anderson Building. Um, I've always been pro square footage versus front footage or linear footage. So please follow me here. If you took the total assessment and divided all the square footage of all the properties that are affected into that, that would be what's fair because a property that's five acres compared to my property, which is 3,823 square feet, not 38,000, 3,823 square feet, certainly doesn't have the utility of a property that's five acres. So if you take my assessment of $48,600, divide my square footage of the land only into that, I'm paying $12.72 a square foot. If you take the Anderson Building property, which has the same sidewalk benefits that we have on our side, divide their square footage, assuming they're paying the same front footage, $900 a square foot that I'm paying, they are paying $2.28 a square foot. So a multi-million dollar piece of property pays $2.28 a square foot compared to the small properties paying $12.72. That doesn't seem equitable, reasonable. If all that square footage was divided into the total assessment, the big guys would have been paying reasonable to the little guys. That's why I, I think the whole assessment thing was done wrong on the front footage. It doesn't take into consideration the utility of the properties. In addition to that, the apartment that I have on the corner, eight unit apartment, the city put nine parking places there in the access road. None of the tenants can use it because it's two hour parking. So they have to get up in the middle of the night and go and move their car or whatever. There's nothing, if, if it would have just said two hour parking, nine to five, Monday through Friday, that'd be fine. Then the tenants can park there at nighttime, but they can't 
parked there at nighttime without maybe getting a ticket. So it's something like that. I would like to pay my fair share. And one of the engineers in a couple of meetings ago, um, it was in your paperwork, I believe, no, it was $159, it should be a front foot for the type of improvements we had on our sidewalk. That times my 3,823 or um, 54 square feet or front footage would be $8,500 would be my fair share. And that's with somebody not being able to use this, the parking that's in front of the property. And I know that I know the um, sprinkler systems can be fixed probably, but now the people have to walk out the street when the sprinklers are on because they way overshoot the landscape area. So that's just another consideration. Plus, the city's putting garbage cans right out front, trash cans right out in front of the units. So who knows what time in the night people are going to be throwing stuff in there, making noise or whatever. So I'm not seeing all the benefit that some people believe that we are getting. And the benefit should be looked at income producing on a property. I'm just talking from an appraiser standpoint. That's the benefit. If you did this in a residential area, that might be great. It might improve the property. But again, I'm still willing to pay what is reasonable. And in my case, I think it's 8,500. So thank you. Thank you. Next is James Bush. Hello, my name is James Bush. Um, I'm here to re represent myself and my sister. We own the property at 18606 Bothell Way Northeast. We're just south of Cafe Ladro. Um, I think what you're gonna hear tonight from the various owners is um, not that we're not willing to pay um, a reasonable assessment, but that the amount that the city's come up with is not equitable. Um, on notices that I've received over the last several months um, is uh, it was originally titled the Downtown Re Reimbursement Assessment. Uh, the road and frontage improvements are a benefit to the city as a whole to make it more pedestrian friendly is what a lot of the paperwork said. And therefore, I think those costs should be paid by the city as a whole, or at least by more than just uh, the unfortunate property owners that happen to line Bothell Way. I'd also like to point out that the property to the north of Cafe Ladro at 18704 Bothell Way Northeast, uh, commonly known as the Caliber Home Loan Building, also has frontage improvements on it, yet they're not included in the assessment for some reason. I inquired with Don as to why they were not included in the assessment, in, in the assessment and after some back and forth, his final answer was that they didn't have a uh, uh, access lane in front of their building. Um, this didn't make sense to me because we've been told uh, that what we're paying for is the frontage improvements, not that we have an access lane in front of our property. Um, I have sidewalk, street lights, um, landscaping trees in front of my property, and that's what I'm being assessed on. And so does this, so does this building. Um, here's a photo that I'd like to pass out. You could project it too if you wanted to, if it's just one copy. So this is in front of the Caliber Home Loans building. They have the same sidewalks, the same new street lights, um, landscaping. This was all constructed in front of their building as well. And so this is just another example of why the, the um, reimbursement assessment is not reasonable and equitable. There's improvements that have been made to some properties, and this is one example that they're not being assess assessed for it. And so again, it's not reasonable. Um, and equitable. Um, some of these big companies here in, in the downtown, the Six Oaks, the, the McMenamins, the Shag Building, they are big, huge companies uh, that can come in and they can afford these assessments. There's other people here tonight, like my dad, uh, like myself representing me and my sister. Um, 
there's there's the owners of Cafe Ladro. They're not big, huge corporations. We can't afford these big, huge assessments if we want to do redevelopment. And so what you're ending up doing here is you're stagnating redevelopment. If, if that's what you want to do is stop redevelopment and stop development in downtown, this is what you're going to do by passing this assessment at this high of level. It's just going to stop it's going to stop the development. And so uh, I ask that you reconsider this at this level and make it something more reasonable and more equitable. Otherwise, it's just going to stop stop development and, and hurt uh, the little guys in town from being able to, to do anything with their properties. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Carrie Westerbeck. Good evening. Thanks for uh, listening to us. Um, I'm here to object the, to the downtown assessment as well, but maybe not for the reasons you're thinking. I just really want to set the record straight. There's this, this information out there that we don't want to pay, and, and um, <clears throat> I'm the last person who's anti-tax or anti-public infrastructure or anything. I, I'm very willing to pay uh, what is equitable and fair. And I've known about the, um, the assessment for a couple of years, and I kept asking Don and other people, how much is it going to be? I'm, tr I'm trying to, I'm planning a project. I've, I've got a project coming up. And I live on 98th uh, on the property we're going to redevelop across from the library. But um, so we don't object to it. And uh, we just want it to better reflect, like others said, um, what we would have paid uh, private companies to build that furniture for ourselves instead of having the city do the Cadillac Ferrari version instead of the very fine Honda version we might do ourselves. Um, so I just want to make sure everyone understands that we're, we're not objecting to it. We're not saying we don't want to pay. We just want it to be commensurate with uh, what would be required of us if we did it privately with our own contractors. Um, and we also take, uh, I think, um, so some of us a little bit of offense to, that uh, these are just average improvements that everyone have to do. Um, the staff themselves, and I'm sorry, I'm going to bring up Don, said it was the Cadillac version that they put in. And it, it's fun. I like the Cadillac version. It's nice. but. I'm not sure if the city would have required me in the Bothell Municipal Code to put in the, the Cadillac. They probably would have, again, maybe do a really nice Honda for sidewalks and frontage improvements. Um, and something I've written you guys about, and um, I don't want to bug people about it too much, but um, frontage improvements come at the end of a project, not the beginning. So there's that. So the sequencing is completely off uh, because there's a lot of site work, and uh, we're going to inevitably have to cut up some of that frontage work when we uh, put in our projects if it's already in place. Also, um, the timing, we have to pay it to just get our permit um, issued. Uh, they do a lot of permitting of projects and that money isn't available for most projects until after the permit is in hand and we actually get the project funded. Anybody who does development knows that. So to ask for a piece of construction to be paid for before the money has been issued from the bank is really backwards. And it's completely just flips the process on its head. So most projects, if you bring 25 or 30 percent of a project um, fees to the table yourself and you borrow another 70, 80 percent. Well, we got to get another 5 percent or whatever then ourselves to pay up front just to get our permit um, when we would actually be that would part be part of the bank loan and part of the actual construction process later on, much later in the process. So it's that's a big burden, especially if, whether you're big or small. And I'm small, mom and pop developer, as it were. So that's really sticking with me uh, as I go through my pro formas and my numbers over and over and over. Um, and then you know the city's got all the power to control that. They can not issue certificate of occupancies or uh, uh, all kinds of uh, power to to uh, keep us from continuing our project until they get their money. So um, lastly, um, as the others have said, um, you know, we're small time developers and this is sort of a disincentive. Um, I have the opportunity to continue forward right now or not. And um, but we, would have, we would have done this ourselves and not, not, uh, not chosen to do it this particular way at 20% over what we would have paid ourselves at least maybe more. And, um, you know, we live downtown. We want to keep living downtown. We're actually going to live in the project we build. And so we're here. Our family's invested. Um, we want to live downtown. And, and we kind of get the feeling that we're not wanted. Small developers aren't needed. Um, this makes projects much harder to realize when 
we're asked to do an exorbitant fee like this up front. Um, but, you know, equitable is great, but this is a bit too much, and we would ask you to lower it to a more reasonable amount. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Sherry Gallegos. Is that close? Okay. Hi, um, I'm Sherry Gallegos, and I'm here representing Jeff Quinlan. He's the owner of the 18204 and 18212 properties on 98th Avenue. Um, I want to go on record that I'm in agreement of what those previous to me have spoken in regards to the assessment. And I just want to um, reiterate that we are not opposed to the assessment and we're not opposed to paying our portion um, of the assessment. I think um, where we're at is is the, um, the, the, the unreasonable, I think, amount of the assessment. Um, what it does for us as small property owners is, is it's burdensome and it prohibits and disincentivizes us to being able to develop the property, um, meaning it would just have to stay as is. And um, again, it's we've I've heard over and over in this tonight, it's community, that's what it's about. We want to be a part of it. We want to be downtown. We want to develop. We want to grow with Bothell and make it as beautiful as possible. And um, this current um, assessment would not allow us to do that. Um, so I, I just want to say it's, again, an agreement with all of them, but that um, we're not going to be able to get the highest and best use of all of our properties um, if it stands as is. We just feel like it's unreasonable. But we thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you. Uh, next is Dick Paler. Hi, good evening. Uh, just for the, I'm not one of the property owners. I don't represent a property owner here, um, but I have a lot of empathy for, especially the, pro the small property owners, which is the majority of the people that would be subject to this. And you've already heard there's you know, it's not, no, there's no objection to paying a fair share. The, the question is about what's a fair share. And I, I would agree. I think this is, it's excessive, and it's, but it's being applied on the basis that we make frontage or we make developers around the city always pay for frontage improvements. That's true in, in almost every case. Uh, but these are not your everyday frontage improvements. They're, they're like no other frontage improvements anywhere else in the city. Um, that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It probably should have been spread across all of downtown, but it's probably too late to do that. However, I, I want to suggest a way that you could pass this ordinance and do it in a way that would be equitable. And that would be if you make an exception to the code where uh, a developer could credit the traffic impact fees that they will pay in addition to this assessment. If those impact fees were a credit against this assessment, that would probably make it all tolerable to these developers. Um, because I'm, I'm very sure that all seven of you want all these properties to be developed sooner rather than later. But as it's been said, for most of these small properties, and many of them are very small, but they still have big frontage and therefore a big bill, that's a disincentive for them to either develop their property or agree to sell their property to somebody to be redeveloped. So rather than a disincentive, provide an incentive by saying, maybe if you redevelop or apply for a permit within seven years, that you then could take a credit for the impact fees. So the money would come into the city. That's what you're trying to do here, but it would be done in a way that is, you're doing it with an incentive instead of a disincentive. And I actually think you'll end up better off because many of these parcels will just not be developed for 15 years and then you'll get nothing for this. So think about creating an incentive to make it happen. That's my two cents for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Next is John Lemanzakis. Sorry. 
thank you. Uh, we are the owners of the Cafe Ladrill site, and here, again, we're not opposed in being assessed. I use the word assessed because we don't have anything at this time toward development, but future-wise, of course. Uh, a reasonable amount. Now, what might be reasonable for one person, of course, might not be for the other. In our particular case, we're restricted. It's almost a triangle other than the two neighbors that I have. There is no property right behind us, such as other parcels along the way which they can be assembled. Or our parcel frontage comes out to about $920 a lineal foot. Now, I can understand being assessed by a lineal foot because the charge has been presented to you on the front of you by the contractor as a lineal foot charge. But at the end of the day, it appears to be that there must be somewhere down the line something that can be realigned where the burden would not be so heavy future-wise. At the end of the day, what you're basically on the front of you, ladies and gentlemen, the decision you're about to make is definitely is gonna reflect more toward the future as to what people like me are going to do. And we are gonna be at the same time bound or within the covenants or within the restrictions as to what really could do. Like in our side, I asked a developer in a previous meeting, what can I do with approximately 11,000 square feet on a triangle? He says, considering the parking regulations, et cetera, he says, not very much. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Kieran Hines. Good evening. I'm with Widener Apartment Homes and we own the parcels on 98th Avenue between 522 and Northeast 182nd Street, just south of the King County Library. We own those under the entity Bothaway Apartments, LLC. And as I've stated at a couple of prior council meetings, we think that the Horse Creek project is a tremendous ad addition to downtown Bothell and that, and though it did result in a significant delay to our intended project several years ago, we are willing to pay our fair share the associated frontage improvements and utility costs. Unfortunately, the amount that the city is seeking to assess uh, for our property, this comes to over $340,000, is unreasonable in our strong opinion. Though we knew this to be the case uh, from the sheer magnitude of the dollar amount on a per lineal foot basis, we obtained copies of the city's plans and budgets and cost alloc allocation methodology and had various meetings with public works staff and we appreciate their time and efforts to assist us with understanding all of this information. Uh, we then engaged a development a construction consultant with over 30 years of expertise in, in assessing these types of costs and handling budgets for similar projects and he further confirmed that our initial assessment was this is a, a pretty stark uh, overcharge of, of the cost we would have typically incurred as a private owner builder. Uh, this memo has been provided to staff and hopefully to council for your review and we, we feel it raises several salient points. Um, some of the highlights overall, uh, the costs assessed exceed comparable private builder costs by more than double for the frontage improvements and 30% for the utility work connection or the utility connections that were made. Uh, the Im information provided by the city confirms that costs are disproportionately high since they were done as part of a larger Horse Creek 98th Avenue improvements project and further driven by the presence of the creek channel itself, which, which added some cost escalation. Of particular importance is the fact that because the project was undertaken by a general contractor on by behalf of the city as opposed to a private owner builder, the city did not have the luxury of selecting low bidders for individual subtrades. So in purchasing street lighting, you paid uh, a, a dollar amount that we may have been able to negotiate lower with a, an electrical uh, tra uh, trade. One, uh, the street light fixtures in particular were a, a particular eye opener. Uh, a twin head light fixture as stated in the information provided to us, uh, the assessment amount came in at over $16,500 a piece. Uh, there was uh, information in the city's materials that those in a price sheet 
from the city's information stating that those could come in at seventy three hundred and eighty five dollars so over double what some purchase some trades may have been able to provide those for um, these improvements I think the last point I'd like to make is this this is perceived or being conveyed as a strong benefit to property owners but the fact that these improvements have been made out of sequence with with typical development is really a, a big issue as well we're inevitably going to have damage to the frontage improvements we're going to have we're going to be limited into where our utility connections can be made and it's actually going to serve as uh, a bit of an inhibition it's going to fix some connection points for our project that wouldn't otherwise be be dictated in closing whereas we would anticipate seeing public se sector pri uh, project costs exceed private developer costs by an estimated 25 percent we feel that this number is even higher as a result of our consultants analysis and we feel strongly this this warrants thoughtful consideration by council we appreciate your time thank you next is katrina no, bad what Sader, sorry your handwriting is pretty rough oh you're not speaking okay uh kelly atkinson same Oh, they just signed in. They, well, they arts signed in. Okay, that's the Arts in. Commission. Okay. Um, that brings me to the end of my list. Is there anybody else that would like to provide public comment? Seeing none, we'll move into Council uh, Deliberations. And Councilmember Sandberg, did you want to lead off? Not particularly, but I will. Um, I saw Don making notes while the speakers were commenting and I was wondering if you can address some of the points that the speakers brought up. Um, yeah, uh, in general, um, first of all, the cost, um, we gotta, this is what the city actually incurred. So we'll have to be, this will have to be paid by either the taxpayers and or the developers. So that's just a fact. It's um, what the cost is. Um, the, um, Previous examples from Bellevue and Newcastle may or not may not be the same, and they're probably not exactly what uh, what was built here at Bothell. It once again, this is the cost that that, that was paid by Bothell. Um, regarding the uh, prevailing uh, wage uh, comment, um, they selectively took part of the memo and regarding typically being 10 to 20 percent but later on in the memo um, i could read it um, responses from contractors were anecdotal however a number of contractors noted that in today's business climate uh, private and public wages were not significantly different due to a very busy private construction market so the current development climate um, there isn't, from what the consultant uh, discovered, um, a significant uh, difference. Um, discussions with local contractors also indicated the economy of scale benefit of the project, such as constructing a half mile of frontage improvements instead of one block of frontage improvements, would have a much larger impact on the project cost than the differential in wages. Um, since the city was able to construct large, larger projects and divide them equitably between properties through the latecomer agreement, this passed on a cost savings onto affected property owners that would have been more expensive to construct as a smaller project at the time of redevelopment. In their opinion, any cost savings for privately funded projects versus public projects due to prevailing wages is difficult to appropriately quantify and is significantly outweighed by the economy of scale. So, so that's directly from the memo. Um, <clears throat> additionally, um, square foot rather than lineal foot as a method is not the way we have been doing it historically in Bothell for decades. It's been done by lineal foot, it's by, it's the frontage along the property. So I thought I would, uh, and I actually had a slide that I presented at previous meetings regarding that. Um, 
we feel that's the best way. We researched that, we listened, but we feel that lineal footage is the best way. It's what's done and it's consistent with our policy. Um, the transitional property. Um, the property north of the Bush Apartments was a transition and, it, and he's right, um, I did not, I said that the reason why it wasn't in originally is it didn't have the access lane. We originally had the access lane as part of their cost. We took the access lane out. Uh, additionally, that northern property will in the future be redeveloped al along 527 or Bothell Way. And at that time in the future, uh, another project, um, perhaps a downtown reimbursement area could be established and they could be paid for then. That's the way uh, we looked at it. It played out that way um, because we t we listened to them at the at the uh, open house and we took the access lane out and now they're using, they're trying to use that as an argument against it, but uh, that that property should have been assessed, but it would have, uh, it would be assessed at some time in the future perhaps. Don, if uh, I could interrupt. Yes. Is that, is that the property Caliber Loans yes. sits on? Yes, yes. And Okay, so the there was an access lane. There is no access lane there. Okay. There, there is a transit. There's a sidewalk that was a transitional extension of the improvements to the south. Oh, I see what you're saying. There originally was a side access lane that would have continued north, but didn't. Right. It, the project. This project ended there. It ended south of there. But at some point in the future, it may, it it may, may the side the side access lane may continue it's north. It's possible. I think Steve Morikawa might be able to speak better to what the future improvement is there. Um, if you want to. Well, no, it's not important. I don't want to okay. break. Um, another point to bring out is they only have to pay this if they redevelop. They're, they're, uh, the mention of their costs may or may not be true. If somebody else develops the property, they would pay at that time, and it would be in the future. And once again, that would be at two thousand sixteen dollars, not at um, the dollar amount that it would cost at the future time. Um, let's see. So the Cadillac improvement statement, um, the cities down. This is the downtown standard. This is what we required of previous developers. We've we've had other developers pay for it in the purchase and sales agreement, and it's what we would require of any developer in the future in that area. Um, The transportation impact fee credit issue, I we would have to research that more. I think there would be a big problem with that. It would set a precedent. It's for a different, it's not apples to apples. It would be, it's for a different reason. It's for a different purpose. And it certainly would impact our transportation dollars. Um, but it would need research before we were to um, allow such a thing. And just to um, ask further about that. The right-of-way improvements are to provide improvements that are required by city code immediately in front of their property. Traffic impact fees are assessed based on the usage of the property that apply to identified projects that um, in, increase capacity in our overall network system. So when you say it's apples to oranges, right. It, it sounds like it wouldn't even be legally um, uh, allowable to do that. I don't believe it would be, but we would have to research it. Although um, we could in the future, with future research, I would imagine, I'd ask the city attorney too, that the, the concept of providing an incentive to encourage development and offsetting some kind of cost somehow isn't entirely out of the question. Probably not in the scope of this discussion here, but I, it, the I, point was taken from the from the speaker that right. if you disincentivize development for 15 years, we all lose. Whereas right. if the, if we could create some kind of incentive 
then it could become a win-win situation. I'm just not sure rebating the traffic impact fees is that vehicle. Right. I was going to tag on to that, that comment. The fit, he, I think Mr. Paler is correct. When you, it, it, there is the potential that they don't redevelop within 15 years, you don't get anything. Like he said, that is certainly a consideration. There's, um, and how we can, we don't have a crystal ball, we don't know how that would play out, but certainly there's an argument there. I, 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 I totally agree with that. But that's um, up for uh, debate, I would say, too, just as to what's the threshold, so. And nobody really knows, I think. But um, I think that's I think that's all the notes I have. But I could also answer any questions. The first speaker mentioned an analysis by Don Bowser. Did we receive that? Yes, we have that. It's in the packet. Okay, I'm sorry, I missed that. And then um, another speaker brought up um, the timing of the payment of the assessment. Can you, can you speak to that, and do you see flexibility in that? Yes, that would be a change to our actual development code that we could make, and it would be, it could be pertinent to other developments outside the reimbursement area. We, um, I forgot which chapter it is. We actually have done some research on that. That, that is something we could bring back if the council would want us to, to direct us that, in that direction. So, um, you said it's it's a, a code requirement that applies to all development, right? That they, so they, and what Mr. Westerrick was talking about is that we could um, delay the the payment so they wouldn't have to have so much upfront cost, and it could it, we could hold up the certificate of occupancy, um, and that and that's something that we could discuss in general for development. And is that a change we could make? unique to the reimbursement area without making the change citywide? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, Paul, do you know? That would it? be something I would, I'm, I'm not prepared to really answer that question right. here. Um, I knew we, any changes that are made to the development code um, presumably could be retroactive if council so uh, desired and as long as certain language was in uh, the ordinance to make that change. But um, at this point, it's pure speculation. I wasn't prepared to really answer that question. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think that was my questions for right now. Thanks. Okay. Deputy Mayor. <laughs> Thanks, Don. I have a, a few questions myself. Um, is there a way to address um, having to rebuild frontage if um, they have to take it out and rebuild it? it? It does, that does seem to me to be an issue um, that potentially is hard hard for a developer to bear. Oh, so if the frontage was damaged. Is, uh, right, it, uh, there's been an argument that <coughs> in building their projects, it's out of sequence to have already had, well, to already have built the frontage and so then they would have to rebuild. I think we might have to research that. I would think there might be a mechanism, but I think we need to yeah. research that. Okay, because I, I would be interested in, in a way to address that. Um, I'm also interested uh, in um, how we could rearrange payments so it's not prior to the permit. Um, and then I had a question, um, you know, there's been back and forth about square footage and linear footage and, and what it's um, incentivizing. And I think in some ways the um, a square footage would, would um, incentivize smaller projects. And so in thinking that through, I wondered if, um, and this isn't fair to you because you have no idea this is coming, but I had a, I had a thought uh, along the lines of um, Mr. Paler's comments. Would, would it be um, feasible in your mind to incentivize, say for the next seven years, a 10% discount? Because surely after nine years, there's no difference. I mean, there really is no difference between public and private costs. Um, and so I guess if the thought is to in incentivize development now along that area, would some, some sort of reduction, a time-limited reduction make sense in, in um, incentivizing that? Uh, 
I know it's not fair. You know, my, pers <laughs> my personal opinion. Uh, <laughs> I've never, I would have to give it some thought. To tell you the truth. Is it possible to write that in your opinion in the code or, or uh, city attorney, do you have a thought on that? Uh, I mean, generally anything is possible. Um, haven't contemplated it before you addressed it right now, so we'd have to do some research into. Yeah, sorry, I, did, I just that. thought of it. Um, given the circumstances and the and the comments, but it seems to me that um, we are trying to incentivize development, and certainly there are um, changes in cost over time, and it seems if if the, if we wanted to allay that that argument that um, they're having to pay more uh, um, because it was a public publicly bid project, then we could we could have some sort of scale uh, after time, like a reduction for the first seven years or five or whatever. Anyway, that's um, just a, a question that I wanted to put out there in terms of what was possible. Um, and I will save my comments for later. Thank you. Any more questions of staff? Councilor Spivey? Thank you. Um, I, I guess I'm missing that uh, analysis that was done on Coal Creek and up in the Crossroads area. So, uh, Don, do you know exactly where along Coal Creek that was done uh, and where in Crossroads? I'm not real familiar with the area. I, I, I read the, <clears throat> should have to, I would have to pull out the. No, I, I, I guess I was looking for a kind of a map that might have showed where those were. And yeah, I'll see if there's a map here. Attachments. I'm fairly familiar with both areas. So the report basically came in a letter form and stated its okay. conclusions and had a table that basically compared city actual costs versus what was spent on those two projects. Um, but I think the analysis was done that they could not release that information. So we don't know exactly where it was in those two projects. So right now the staff has to take it on the assumption that they're comparable, but we don't know that. I think the bottom line is they were trying to show that private developers can do this uh, less expensively than the city. And I think the city does not necessarily disagree with that. I think it's just probably the amount, how much less it is, mm -hmm. that um, is kind of the debatable point. All right. Well, and it, it also matters where the developments occur, too. I, that, that does play a, right. a big so role Right, so a lot of things... You know, we had the backup here, and we sh we showed what kind of lights we were putting in, how wide the sidewalks. We weren't able to verify that because they were unable to give us direct information and who their client was. So we don't know if there were standard, um, you know, lights you see down the highway versus you know antique looking um, downtown lights. Right. So we can't we couldn't do that comparison. Well, it, it, because it would be nice to know if it's a if it's a brand new project where there, everything's new and you're not working around existing utilities or buildings that that simplifies the work versus working around exist, is, is exist, existing infrastructure in buildings. So and that may, creates a cost differential. And so that that's why I was curious to know where these things were to make sure we're comparing apples to apples. So, all right, um, that's all I have for now, thanks. Anybody else have questions? Councilman Ragnew? Well, I have uh, some questions and some comments. Uh, you know, I, I, I agree with uh, Deputy Mayor Doerr that we should probably try to see if we can change the payment prior to permit. Uh, I also was uh, listening to one gentleman that was talking about parking signs up in front of his place and and how they were two hour parking and maybe we can do something about that. Maybe we can put up some parking signs that say Monday through Friday, nine to five, and, and that will help out el eliminate that issue. Uh, most of the other questions I have have been answered by council and by staff. Uh, so I'll yield the floor to some of my other council members. Councilman Fried. Great. 
Um, Don, what about the opportunity to recalculate what the frontage cost would be with just our standard required frontage? So standard sidewalk, planter strip, curb, not the Cadillac version, as they say, but uh, the Honda version. <laughs> no offense to Honda. Uh, we could. Well, we, we could calculate it, certainly. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could do an estimate, but that could be, certainly could be done. Sure, because if these developments take place and we didn't have the frontage already in, they would be required what we have in our code to build, right? So in advance, we built something better than what they would have to build. So it seems right to go back and build more on what they would have had to under our code. Under our code, under our code, though, we, we would refer to the downtown plan, which would have this requirement. The souped up yes. lights and all the planter strip yeah. and yes. file swales and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. That That is the one problem mm -hmm. versus just outside of this area would have certainly a different look. Yes. Uh, what is our typical traffic mitigation fee per unit? I, I, I don't have it memorized. Um, I could pull it's it out. 150 bucks per unit, do you think? or? Oh, more than that. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, I mean, um, I wonder if it could even equate to $340,000 in cost on the Widener property. So it's, so it's based on trip generation and what, how many trips are generated by the development. Mm -hmm. And then we, we have a study that backs it up. Um, yeah, I mean, we could come back with that. But, I mean, it, it, once again, this is not a compa it, it, it's a, for a different purpose altogether. And um, it would set a it, it would set a precedent, if nothing else. And I think we would have to research if it's um, something we would even want to consider. Great. One, one of the initial questions or concerns that I expressed several months ago was some of these props, properties in downtown have a higher yield than others. And it seemed um, unequitable to be charging one certain frontage that has maybe a more narrow frontage that could have a greater yield than some other properties. That's why I like the analysis of looking at each of the properties under our current coding, seeing what is available, and then billing, or sorry, whatever you would want to call it, uh, putting an assessment on those properties based upon the potential yield of a property. Because if somebody can develop 50, they can reallocate those funds over 50 units where somebody would only have 10 on theirs. It seems to me I like that way of doing things. So, so once again, this is this, the way we've been doing it. This is our policy. This is consistent with the way we've done it. Mm -hmm. This would be a new, a new frontier. Absolutely. It would, it would set a precedent. And, I, and it's very problematic, I think, because uh, you would have a lot of scrutiny to, to worry about how much, how much can it be built out. Can we, and, you know, you have to look at down, is it, what, but what about the parking and this and that? It's got too many moving parts, and it, it would be very complicated, I think, to administer. I appreciate and, that. And we did do we did look into that, and we just didn't feel it was appropriate. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the last question I have is: there was a comment, I, yeah, I believe you made that other properties in downtown had already basically paid into this system for frontage. I think we negotiated in some purchase and sale agreements $190,000 or something to that extent, and the developer built the frontage rather than, so was that calculation based upon what we're looking at now, similar in cost, or is that negotiated at a lower price? It's it's similar. It's, um, I don't know if we have all the costs, like for Six Oaks, what they built. I know, and, um, yeah, maybe Steve, Steve would be better. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> So a lot of the agreements uh, for some of our surplus properties were actually done years ago right? Um, before we actually started building. So they actually used estimates at a certain stage in our design, 60% design, yep. and they actually are probably higher. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you, Steve. And then other ones built, other ones built. And that the ones that were built is one you're kind of questioning, well, how much did they pay? And I don't think we have those figures, but... Um, Good. Well, we've been having a lot of success in downtown, a lot of forward movement, and I think we, we want to see that continue, and so I appreciate the thoughts and the, certainly the comments of the people that came forward tonight. Thanks. Councilmember McNeil. Thank you. I just had a couple brief questions. Um, on the, the start of this process, when did, when did all this start? Was it 2011? The downtown redevelopment? Yeah. Uh, like, um, so um, Six Oaks was the first property that redeveloped, and it, I think it started in 2014. Okay. Or maybe 2013, around that, that time. And w were all the cost analysis done at that time? 
or are we just now getting to that? As far the as cost, the, the cost that we've generated here? Yes. Uh, so the 98, that's the actual finished cost. The multi-way project is um, the, I think, uh, it's once again probably a better question for Steve, but it, it's, a, it's an estimate, but it was based after the bid was, bid came in, and, and uh, I think we even made adjustments after it got going. So it, it's uh, pretty, pretty close to what the actual cost is, so. Of the actual project so the process of the ordinance for paying for this work and the improvements has been an ongoing process since 2014 or longer yes and if the, if the development so we we did the improvements to improve to bring in development correct yes. and, and I'm assuming that's why we improved the roads and did all the things that we did down there, correct? To bring development in, to revitalize the downtown. Yes. And those decisions were made in 2014. Well, decisions were made along the way over many years. Just from the downtown vision with, with the downtown you know, plan. Um, and then we had uh, the Big Horse Creek project and and the consideration of we're tearing everything up, we're going to put the, you know, the frontage in with it. And um, I mean, it, it's over many, many years that the whole thing came together, I would say. Uh, I'm not sure what you're... Well, the reason I'm asking the questions is because obviously somebody has to pay for this. Yes. Okay. And I think uh, you alluded to it, that if the development doesn't pay for it, the community is going to pay for it. Yes. And so as an elected council member, I want to make sure that we're being fiscally responsible um, and we're doing development pays for development. But at the same time, we want to make sure that we continue to have development in our downtown core. We want to be fair and equitable. I heard somebody mention small, we don't want small development or something like that. No, I think we absolutely do want small development. Um, I've never heard any one of these council members up here say they don't want development of any kind in the downtown core. But again, I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around the process of how we got where we are today and why we're this far down the road and who's going to pay for it. Um, because ultimately, um, is it something that the community should be paying for? And ultimately, is it fair and equitable to be doing it by a lineal foot versus a square footage price? And I don't, I'm, I'm looking at the chart, the, the slide that, that we have in the PDF, um, and I, st I still can't make out um, the difference between a side street cost of doing the side street versus the cost of doing the sewer, installing the sewer versus the cost of installing the storm. I, I can't make, I can't ascertain what all that is. And what I'm trying to, to make sure is that if a guy has 800 feet of frontage versus a guy that has 100 foot of frontage, what's fair and equitable to him? And I, I really want to wrap my head around that to make sure that it's fair and equitable. I mean, is it better to go square footage or is it better to go linear footage? And, and that's really the basis of my question is, I, at this point, I don't have enough inf information to know the cost. If a guy has five acres, right, what is his cost for five acres on a square, uh, square footage basis versus that same five acres linear foot price? So you just take one of the parcels as an example. <coughs> Um, I mean, a lot of that would be, you know, could be debatable. But there's there's pros and cons to each way you do it. But um, when you look at a, pro a property that's going to develop, um, you you have you have them develop along their frontage. You have them do the improvements along their frontage, the sidewalks, which makes sense. You're, they're going to be building right in front of their property. Um, so. The way we've been, the city has been doing it historically, once again for decades, is charging that way. Um, if you want to look at some of the pros and cons about it, well, what is, is frontage valuable? Yes, it's very valuable. So if they have a lot of frontage, but maybe not as much square footage, well, they still have a lot of value in their property because they have frontage. Um, but, I mean, you could also look at it the other way, as, you know, the, as uh, Mr. Bush brought up. But... Um, I think you have to weigh it. Um, you have to to look at all the angles and make a decision. And I think you know what the city's done historically. Once again, though, 
which is the precedent, is we've been charging by lineal foot. So that seems to be the appropriate way. And I, and I, I thought I heard you mention that regardless of the city doing it or the developer doing it, that would it would have this would have had to been done. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. So the only difference would be what it cost the city versus what it cost the developers. And then if you look at if it's going to develop today versus four, three, four, five years down the road, I thought I heard you say something about what the it's still going to be in today's cost versus yes. future costs. Yes. Okay. Um, So, I think that I think that answers the questions that I have right now. Thank you. Okay, I just had a couple of additional questions for you. The um, so the assessment reimbursement area is a tool for local governments to basically reimburse costs of large capital projects, and it can be used for private industry too. Can private Yes, they, the private. In fact, it's more common, actually. Yeah. Okay. But so the state law allows a city or local government to do this and to have a reimbursement yeah. area. Yeah. Is there in any case where there's a city that can build these projects that is not prevailing wage? The city couldn't build it at anything other than prevailing wage. Okay. Because we have, we're subject to all that. Right. So that's why I, I don't know. I was just kind of I was getting hung up on the the people who were concerned they could do it for cheaper. But if the city creates a reimbursement area, which we can, we have to pay prevailing wage to create the project to begin with or build the project. Um, if we change the ordinance tonight, would there be would we have to restart this process? Uh, Paul, can answer that. Uh, no, you can. It well. If you are considering lowering the amount by a specific percentage, that would be allowable. That uh, that's something we can easily change in the uh, in the ordinance with your direction, uh, as long as it, the motion to amend is made, it's voted on, and then the ultimate vote is to uh, pass the ordinance with the with the changes that have been made tonight. Um, I think case law would support. Um, uh, it would be a defensible position if you if council were to um, decide at their discretion to lower the amount, um, I do not think you go above the stated amount. So what if there's some other ideas that people have brought up about changing how it's assessed and how? In terms of the percentage, I'm pretty confident because I've done the research um, or we've had the research done that a percentage uh, reduction would be allowable by case law. A percentage reduction over a specific period of time, uh, I would have to look into further. The assessment reimbursement area allows for a maximum of 15. I don't know if case law would support a temporary reduction for a period of 10 years or so. Uh, and so I wouldn't be able to answer that question tonight with any sort of uh, definity. Okay. The, so then I look at this map and it has the assessment parcels and there's asterisks on the ones that there's no assessment. And so I started to think to myself, how, and then if you think about how some of these have already redeveloped and are not likely gonna redevelop again in the next 15 years, have we, and I looked through the, I, I hope it's not in the packet, but do we have any idea like how much uh, reimbursement we're talking about here in the next 15 years? Have we, do we have any projections? I don't have a projection. I, I project, uh, I do have projections for the Horse Creek downtown storm facility charge and generally it seems like about, we, we figure that about half the properties would redevelop it. I, I don't know on this court, these two corridors, um, what we'd be looking at. I mean, certainly there's a, a couple that seem likely, the Widener property obviously uh, seems likely, but, uh, um, and I believe there was one property that was just repur repurchased, so you would figure that it would be redeveloped, but uh, we really don't have a, a concrete, uh, uh, ideas as far as how many are going to. Okay. I would I would I would get, estimate half as in the 20 year in a 15 year period. I guess is what I would. So it was like 23 million. I think it was for the whole. The, what's the grand total of all the project costs that we've piled onto this assessment area that we're the, divide well, out by linear feet? This assessment area is around, I think it's around two million total for the. It's a little over two. Um, one point. 
the the frontage improvements on um, multi-way are 1.2 million and there's about 1 million on 98th and 120,000 on 98th so it's about 2.3 2.4 million is what the reimbursement area covers right and then, and then there's and a whole bunch of parcels that have linear footage that, that already, obviously that would be applied right, to right so the whole the whole multi-way project is uh i think it is around 20 million i'm not sure i'm not worried about that i'm just trying to figure out like what are we talking about because i think what we're talking about is it's about 2.3 2.3 2, 2 million is the total uh assessment for both all three projects 2.3 million and then you take out all the properties that have the asterisks on them no, no, the, no. Two point three is the ones that haven't that that haven't paid anything or built anything. What about? Okay, I don't want to get. Into, I don't know the name of that lot. Hmm. What about the hotels that are going on this lot? Uh. They have asterisks on all three of those parcels. Right. That would be. It? That's because it would be part of the purchase and sales agreement oh is that the asterisks are about those are the purchase and sale agreements i believe so let me double check because 20 number 20 doesn't have one an asterisk on it but it's in a purchase and sale agreement and 24 is a purchase would be purchase of sales the city owns it and that would sell it and that'd be part part of the purchase and sales agreement so we're we're probably talking about between a million probably less in reimbursements that we would get over the next 15 years if the half if the 50 percent uh number is used yes okay um do we have an appeal process for is there some circumstances that have been brought up tonight that seem pretty um harsh or not harsh but you know there's there's some parcels that are having a harder time than others is there an, then we know we have an appeal process for traffic impact fees that you can do a study and come back to us and say hey look so it's a city attorney question i believe uh that's that's the point of the sending out the information to the property owners uh giving them time to present their objections at the public hearing so this is the process um once council acts to uh, create the assessment reimbursement area via the ordinance then the only avenue that way they can challenge it is through the legal process so you, so you can't challenge it like you do with the traffic impact fee where you can do the study there's a piece of code that says you can do the study and come back to that's administratively what this, that's what this is for right now the, the discussion that we're having and the ability for them to present their objections and the basis for those objections and then that's it that's it. it just doesn't matter after that they're just going to get the bill when they go to get a permit which I actually agree with these two council members that that doesn't seem like the, the best timing for this because frontage improvement costs don't typically come before but you there, there get your permission. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, their, their opportunity to be heard and to object to it is the purpose of today's hearing. Okay. Um, okay, that, those are all the questions I had. Are we ready for a motion? We're past our break time. We usually take a break at eight, but is everybody doing okay? Let me finish this item up. Okay, here we go. Is there a motion? <laughs> if there's no motion, there then we're done. Motion. Council Member Samberg? I'm just getting it. I'm getting to the page. I move that we approve an ordinance establishing an assessment reimbursement area and reimbursement connection charges for the downtown utilities and frontage improvements. And I will be making some amending motions after the main motion. It's moved Second. and moved by Councilor Sandberg, seconded by Council or Deputy Mayor to approve the, an ordinance establishing an assessment reimbursement area and reimbursement connection charges for the downtown utilities and front engine improvements. Would you like to speak to your motion? Uh, yes, I would like to speak to my motion. Um, I think there is a really important lesson learned in this process, and we're learning about just in general in downtown revitalization. And that is, we were all excited with the picture and everybody was jazzed about what it could be. And now we're having to face to pay the costs. And, and that, that is a huge learning curve. And I can still remember being a young junior council member years ago when we were talking about the downtown master plan 
um, and that would have been in 2008 or sooner because we talked about the downtown master plan um, even before that. I had a, a community member come to me after the presentation about how great this whole downtown plan was and he shook his finger at me and he said, how are you gonna pay for all this? And I was shocked, but it was a really good question. And the staff member who was with me at the time said, well, development's gonna pay for that. And I thought, well, that doesn't sound quite right, but it temporarily appeased that citizen and got me off the hook. But the fact of the matter is, development is not paying for all of this. When we look at the cumulative costs of all the infrastructure improvements that we have done in this city, that is bringing excitement and activity to this city, that is increasing property values, that is wanting people to come here, talk about $60 million for crossroads, $23 million for the Multiway Boulevard, $19 million for Horse Creek and the Horse Creek Improvements, which by the way, allows all the development in downtown to do a direct discharge in the Sammamish River and, re and replace, it replaces the need for them to build on-site detention, um, stormwater improvements. Uh, and what else do we got? $7 million for uh, Main Street improvements. I mean, that's that's over a hundred million dollars in improvement that is benefiting the community, it's benefiting property owners. And who's paying for most of that? One of the property owners said, you know, I'll pay for the part that's in front of my place and I want it at a, at a price that I would have been able to get it at for a Honda improvement. Well, who's really paying for that are the taxpayers and the utility rate payers. We're paying a significant portion of that. And, and when we reduce what your input is, which is increasing the value of your property, we're increasing the burden on the taxpayers and the rate payers. We're already subsidizing, to a huge extent, the cost of infrastructure improvements in the city, which is a benefit for the city as a whole. So um, I am gonna be making some amending motions um, that address some of the concerns, but I also want to point out a few other concerns that we've already addressed. The multi-way boulevard costs were reduced by 43% in response to property owner concerns. Um, we've changed the language so that in the case of catastrophic loss, you, when you rebuild or redevelopment, redevelop, um, you, don't, you don't have to pay um, these costs um, as long as you rede uh, redevelop in a reasonable amount of time. Um, so I sit up here with you and you ask, I'm wrapping my head around it. How did we get to this spot? Well, we got to the spot by dreaming and not being thoughtful and practical about the cost in the end. But we, like Don Fien said, we built the improvements and we're charging the cost that we built the improvements that the community wanted and the community was on board with. We built them at our costs not at Coal Creek cost. Um, we built them to a vision that the community bought into, and in large part, the community is paying for this. And so, um, so I'm supporting um, the main motion, but I'm also going to make some amending motions as well. Any further discussion on the motion? I'd like Deputy to speak Mayor. to my second. Um, I agree with a lot of what Council Member Sandberg said. I'm discouraged that when we make a reduction of 42.6%, the response we get from the developers is, it's just not fair. I mean, there's no, it seems like there was public comment. I felt like staff w went out of their way to try to address people's concerns, and there's just no mention of a 42.6% reduction. That's really discouraging to me. Um, I think it's more than fair. We took the ac access lane out, and yet the, those buildings that are behind those access lanes now have free parking. Yes, maybe we need to make improvements with the timing, but those are access to your businesses and your buildings that weren't there before. Um, I think it's um, unfair to the developers who've already developed and paid in their um, development agreements for frontage I think it would be completely unfair to say, oh, well, you know, you get a pass. Um, you don't need to pay. Um, 
as far as the Cadillac version, I, I don't know where I come from. If you get a Cadillac, you pay for a Cadillac. You don't get a Cadillac and pay for a Honda. Um, as far as the square footage, I don't know how to reconcile that because if you make it about square footage, um, then you're incentivizing um, small projects in a way because, you, you know, oh, well, I'll, I won't do a six-story building. I'll do two stories because it's, it's less square footage. Maybe I'm wrong, but it seems like it's, it's um, rewarding smaller projects. Um, I also have some amending motions. I guess I'll see what Council Member Sandberg's um, are, but I, I just, I think it's a fair thing to charge for what work was, was done, and hopefully with our many motions, we can address some of these other issues. Any further discussion on the motion? Or we can go through, oh, Council Member McNeil. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I will be abstaining uh, from this vote. Um, I have a relationship um, in 1997 I built a uh, townhome project for the Widener Group in um, Issaquah Highlands, and uh, most recently I have been bidding a project for, uh, I believe it is the son of Cafe Ladro, uh, Johnny Lemonzakis. Uh, so I'll be abstaining, but I do want to point out that um, I've made my points. I'm excited to hear the conversation from the council. Um, I did not want to recuse myself because uh, I owe it to the community to be part of the conversation. We are a body of seven and we should at least be able to have this conversation um, and then make sure that uh, I leave it in your hands to, uh, to take this vote. So thank you. Any further discussion on the motion or an amending motion? Oh. Nope. Discussion on the motion? Council Member Freed? I don't want to speak on the underlying motion because I heard there's two council members that want to make amending motions to their motion. So. I'd rather see what those amending motions are, then maybe we'll have a chance to talk about the underlying motion. Councilor Sandberg. Okay, I just wanted to do the amending motions one at a time to make it simpler. So my first amending motion, a motion is to reduce the assessment such that non-qualifying administration fees pursuant to RCW 3591 are removed from Second. the charge. Second. Moved and seconded to remove um, yeah, that well written. Re the, the, remove the administrative fees from the assessment. Yes. Okay. And can I just speak briefly to that? Sure. We had a um, comment made that um, they felt that that um, was not appropriate, and so um, I think we should reduce, uh, uh, remove those non qualifying administration fees. Can I ask that you restate it? Reduce assessment such that non-qualifying administrative fees pursuant to RCW 35-91 are removed. All right, is there any further discussion on the amending motion? Does everybody understand the amending motion? Yeah, okay. Go ahead, place your vote on the amending motion. Mr. Mayor, can I ask that um, when council's done voting, they let me know because my display is not working. I cannot see when you finish voting. Done. Is everybody done voting? Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Passes. Sorry. That was a yes. <laughs> I think we can do that, right? <laughs> Passes six to, uh, with six in the affirmative with Council Member McNeil abs abstaining. Next, the mini motion. Um, I'll, I'll pass the baton because I don't want to steal a potential amending motion and I can come back if it doesn't get made. Okay. Uh, my first amending motion is um, I would like to have um, the rebuilding of frontage um, addressed by st the staff discretion. If there, if there needs to be rebuilding of frontage, the staff should have discretion to um, offer discounts on the original frontage costs. All right, so there's a many motion to uh, allow staff to adjust the uh, reimbursement cost if we're rebuilding the frontage. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, is there a second? Second for purposes of discussion. Second? Yeah, uh, yeah I'd like to discuss this. Uh, I'm not sure that staff would know up front if there's gonna be a need to rebuild any of it. 
uh, sometimes those things don't come out until um, you know, you, you look at the as belt, you think it's here, but it's not. So, you, and, and, and you plan for it, but you go down there and you. Can you I withdraw my through. motion? To help. I, I, I'll do I just, another I just one think first. it could be a very problematic. Okay. Councilmember Spivey, were you done? That was my discussion for that. Okay. Okay. Let's Sorry. Let's go back to. What are you saying? You have a second on your motion, though. Who made yeah, okay. that second? I withdrew it, though. Can I withdraw it? No, without your second, withdraw. I'll withdraw my second, but I'm going to remake it in a minute. Okay. <laughs> so maybe so that many motion is withdrawn. Yeah. So I think this might take care of it. So I would like to amend payment to be due at st substantial completion for the reimbursement. Second. So it's been moved and seconded to amend the uh, ordinance so that payment is received at did you say substantial, substantial completion. completion. Can we do that, city attorney? It's in the code somewhere else. Is that something we can do with this? Um, I would need. I mean, I would need time to figure out how to do that. Okay. All right, is there any discussion on the mini motion, Councilmember Spivey? Uh, I just would be curious to know what sub substantial completion is, or would it be easier just to say, um, in order to receive the uh, occupancy permit? You could take that as a friendly amendment and work with your second. I'll take that, that as a friendly amendment. I'm not picky. Assistant City, or what, what are to, you right now? Can I speak to my second? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, for purposes of discussion, um, I think it's, I think it's a um, a great idea. Um, I was hoping at the end that we could take a motion to direct staff to examine methods to accomplish that as opposed to trying to draft language now that could get us in trouble later, give staff direction to address that very specific issue and come back to us at a later date. I'm fine with that. I just second it because I yeah. support the no, idea, no, no. Yeah. but we can. I think we can do better. I'm still a newbie. I, you know how these things work better than I do. <laughs> so I can withdraw my second if that's acceptable. So did you want to sp speak up there, Ms. Lenhart? I just wanted to let the council know that currently you do have impact fee deferral program for residential development, and it defers impact fee collection to the final inspection. So just for your information. So we're recreating the wheel. Okay. So the many motion is to uh, charge for frontage improvement at the time of occupancy, substantial completion. Any further discussion on the motion? Councilmember Freed. I I just need some clarity from the maker of the motion. You had a back and forth. Uh, between the two of you saying that we're going to just direct staff to come back with a, an idea. So really, what is the amending motion? And are we talking um, about an idea over the whole underlying motion that's on the table? Yeah, I could actually use some clarity on on this too. What, uh, City Attorney, what, what what's the best way to, to do this? Um, so I'm, I'm looking at BMC three, uh, Chapter 3.05 um, regarding the contract execution and recording and the timing and method of payment. Um, and so under 305090 for timing and method of payment, the payment of the reimbursement assessment by the owner of any property benefited and included in the reimbursement area shall be made prior to issuance of any development approval or building permit for any new development on the property uh, benefited. Um, that would be where any change would be made. Um, I would need time to craft something that uh, falls in line with what council is discussing now. Uh, Are you done? 
I'm still thinking. I don't. I don't have an answer to the question. You were trying to amend code that's not actually in the packet, basically. Yeah. Yes. So uh, I, can, I, can I don't believe that's second. an answer to Councilmember Freed's question. Do you want to withdraw your second? Would you like to withdraw your amending motion? Sure. All right, great. So we're back to the underlying motion, right? Yep. Or do we have uh, an amending motion on the table that has for the reduction? We voted on that, right? Yeah, we did. We okay. we we already reduced the. Uh, assessment to remove non-qualifying administration fees. Right. Okay. Do so you we have only another? have one amending motion. There's one amending motion. Could okay. Pass. I I dare to put out another amending motion prior to my staff direction um, motion, and that is to provide a mechanism by which property owners can recoup the cost of repair of previously installed right of way during the construction phase falling within the 15-year assessment reimbursement time frame. Second. So this moved by Councilmember Sandberg, seconded by Deputy Mayor. Could you explain that a little bit about what you mean by recoup costs? Well, um, they, we've heard uh, testimony about um, the, uh, the timing of infrastructure um, installation. Usually it happens at the end and not at the beginning. And so there is a concern that not only are they paying for the right of way that we installed, but then they're paying for right of way that might have to be that might be damaged during the course of construction or curb cuts that might have to be moved during the course of construction. Um, there seemed to be that concern that seemed reasonable, and um, I. Felt like it was important to include it, this in the ordinance um, because they can provide a cost of repair that is a specific number. They can provide that to staff. All right. Is there any further discussion on the motion, Councilmember Fried? Sorry, there was a motion. Was there a second? There was. Okay. So. Deputy Mayor. I just want some clarity by the motion maker. Are you saying if somebody damages their frontage, all they would be responsible is to make sure that they repair it and put it back to the current design standard? No, that they would they would be compensated for that cost, so they're not paying for it twice. They're not paying for the part that we installed and the part that they had to repair in the course of construction. Okay, so you're not saying if uh, the responsibility would be if the f complete frontage damage was destroyed, their responsibility would be to put it back to the current standard that it is today. Oh, well, that's a good point. I mean, what you're, I mean, that might, well, I don't know. That wouldn't incentivize damaging the right of way. That's stupid for everybody. Um, I guess, so, so what, it, I'm thinking of it one way. What, are, what what's your, your thought of how that could uh, result. Are you concerned that frontage would be damaged and then? Yeah, I'm just trying to understand your m amending motion, what you are trying to accomplish. You're wanting, to, if developers had to replace or repair the frontage, you want them, that's their responsibility. I want them to be compensated. You want them to compensate. Be compensated, be compensated. for that because they will have paid for the right of way through the assessment. Mm -hmm. And they have said that the potential exists to damage that during construction because this is a reverse process for them. Okay. But. And the fees what, are still you, paid at the, the. What do you the, see at the downside? The fees are still paid at the get-go, right at permit issuance? Uh, well, I wanted, the, I wanted to direct the staff later to oh, examine okay. means, but. I don't, I, you know, you're more in the development mm -hmm. um, field. What do you see are, as the pitfalls to that approach? I think there's a lot of contributing factors that making an amending motion like this are, will become problematic. Okay. All right, so is there, I'm sorry, Councilmember Fried, are you done with your comments on the amending motion? Thank okay. you. Anybody else have comments on the amending motion? Seeing none, That's go ahead no. and cast your vote. This is an amending motion to 
uh, allow for a developer to recoup the cost of the damage caused to their right of way uh, during construction by a reduction, I would imagine, in their impact fee or their uh, assessment. Has everyone cast their vote? Yes. Yep. Thank you. Fails uh, with Council Deputy Mayor in the affirmative as and Councilmember McNeil abstaining. And then, so we're back to the underlying motion with the amending motion to reduce the administrative fees. Is there any further amending motions? Councilmember Sandberg. Can, uh, is it appropriate as an amending motion to the, direct the staff to do future investigation or is that something that comes after the motion is, the main motion is adopted that or not? That would be something that would come after the main motion. Okay. Uh, the main motion is to adopt the ordinance and adopt the assessment reimbursement area. Any changes to code that are related to assessment reimbursement areas would preferably be done after the fact when staff has had time to really kind of vet the concerns of council and look at the potential impacts as Councilmember Freed has alluded to. All right, is there any other many motions? Deputy Mayor. Forgive me if my language is not <laughs> all that it should be in code parlay, but um, I would like to add a motion to reduce the re assessment reimbursement by 10% in the next five years, ending after the next five years. Could you go ahead and repeat that motion so it's a little clearer? So I, I would like for us to provide a 10% reduction in the assessment reimbursement over the next five years. So December 2022? No, 2023. So if I could yes. um, ask for clarification uh, so that I can provide uh, advice if necessary. Are you... Uh, essentially trying to incentivize development in the next five years uh, by giving a 10% reduction um, to anyone that would be subject to the assessment reimbursement based on development over the next five years. Yes, I'm, I'm trying to incentivize um, again, I mean, I guess in response to the, the assertions that um, will, will be stymieing development because of the costs. All right, is there a second to the amending motion, which is to um, provide a 10% reduction in the assessment if uh, redevelopment occurs in the next 10 years? Five. You said five years? Five years. Is there a second? Sure. It's seconded by Council Member Freed. Uh, is there any discussion on the motion? Does everybody understand the motion? Council Member Sandberg? Well, I was hoping to direct the staff in the motion after all of this. Um, being a maker of on-the-fly motions, um, I guess I'm not one to criticize. I just, I, um, I would like us to think about this a little bit more. I mean, if, uh, you know, is 10% the right number? Um, and so I feel like we could, we can definitely direct the staff to examine these few, uh, these ideas and come back to us as an amendment to this assessment reimbursement area, but um, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not confident 10% is the right number to incentivize. I think it's a great idea. And I'd like to look into that further. Any further discussion on the mini motion? Seeing none, go ahead and place your vote. I think everybody's voted. That fails. Uh, three in the firm. Did, uh, we won't go through. Three in the firm. Three in the negative. Councilmember McNeil abstaining. Is there any more many motions? Or are we, we good? I think we're good. Is there any discussion on the underlying motion with the amendment? Which the only amendment is that we are reducing uh, administrative costs out of the reimbursement or the assessment. Sorry. Yes, Mayor Freed. Make an amending motion that we defer any of these frontage payments toward CO. That would be certificate of occupancy. Second. 
It's moved and seconded, amending motion to defer uh, assessments to um, the occupancy, certificate of occupancy. Is there any discussion on the motion? Sure, a lot of our fees are actually calculated based upon impact. So you have traffic fees that sometimes are paid in certain jurisdictions because traffic is going to be generated as construction is going on. There's school mitigation fees that we've made decision, I think, as a city to defer till later because obviously kids aren't moving in and schools um, um, or kids aren't moving in. There's some jurisdictions that have pay them paid at the beginning because those fees need to be counted on to improve the schools and preparation of development. I mean, we have in our mind, we, do, we are moving around 2,000 people into downtown. That's a good amount of people and schools are certainly gonna be, need to improve. There's um, master plan communities that are in the area that have six to 7,000 lots. So they charge these fees and they have sometimes two to three schools to build within the communities like Oak Point's doing it, Tahale down south is involved in doing it. Um, other larger developments here in the Puget Sound. So, but in this case, the frontage improvements, uh, the reimbursement we're looking for are something that would typically be finished near the end of development or as part of development. So it just seems to make sense to have them deferred to the end at certificate of occupancy. They won't be able to occupy the building in any any form until those fees are paid. And it is a burden that would be placed on development. And we, like uh, Deputy Mayor Davina or Durer said, uh, we want to encourage development in downtown, not discourage it. Can we extend the meeting during the middle of another motion? You can. Move to extend to 10 o'clock. Okay. Moved by Councilmember Samuel. Second. Second by Councilmember Agnew to extend till 10 o'clock. Any discussion? See none. Place your vote. Mm -hmm. Uh oh. Can you reset it? No, oh, never mind. It passes. <laughs> <laughs> it passes four with three no votes. <laughs> um, okay, so we're back to the amending motion, which is to uh, uh, make payment of the assessment area due at certificate of occupancy. Is there any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, are you ready for us over there? Hold on just a second before you vote. Are you ready? Okay, place your vote. Oh, I did vote. Uh, passes, uh, I, I voted yes, I don't know what happened. Passes uh, with five in the affirmative, Councilmember Freed in, in the ne negative, and Councilmember McNeil in abs abstention. I've done that twice tonight. Oh, okay. Still passes, okay. So there's too many motions. Is there any, what's that? Do you wanna restart that one? Re um, revote? Yeah. Yeah, let's go ahead okay. and revote that. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. When Ready? Get... Everybody place a vote. There we go. There we, and go. we all voted that time. Uh, passes uh, six in the affirmative with Councilmember McNeil abstaining. Any more many motions? Councilmember Sandberg. So I would like to make an motion that we direct staff to investigate methods of incentivizing development. Um, Councilmember Sandberg, we haven't voted on the underlying. Oh, oh I thought you. I thought we no, that was just an that. amending motion. Oh gosh, darn it. Okay. So. All right. No. <laughs> All right, is there any discussion on the underlying motion? I can see it, he wants to. Councilmember Spivey. Oh no, you're ready to vote. So I'd, I'd like to speak real quick on the underlying motion. Um, this was a this is a large uh, amount of money that the city has invested in the downtown. We have done that very intentionally over the last decade. Um, I think in comparison, you can look at, and I was just interviewed actually by the Seattle Times about Kenmore. Um, they, they have taken a more conservative approach, but the city of Bothell, and I think its community wanted us to um, put the capital investment in, uh, the city's uh, investment into the area to, to, to um, invigorate the revitalization of downtown. Um, I think the grand total that um, was talked about by Councilmember Sandberg in north of $100 million um, 
and then I look at what we're talking about in which we would maybe get about a million to between a million and two million back from doing this assessment. And quite honestly with you, to stay with the, um, what's been said tonight about Cadillacs and Hondas, we, we, uh, we built the Cadillac and um, nobody said anything to the property owners that that, that was going to come back on to them. Um, and, and along those lines, you know, to, to look at 1% uh, of the total cost and then create hardships on these smaller parcels and looking at the map, there's very few large parcels that are impacted. Um, I'm not comfortable approving this assessment, so I'm gonna be voting no. Would anybody else like to talk about the underlying motion? Seeing none, go ahead and place your vote. The underlying motion fails. Uh, three to three with Councilmember McNeil abstaining. I believe that's the end of the discussion. Uh, we are going to go to a break and we will be back at, oh, do I, do I need to close the public hearing? Or it's just closed, it's done. All right, we're gonna go to a break and be back at 9.15. <laughs> 